Oh, it's on? Does it work? Right. So before I introduce the speakers, in fact, I guess I'll make a few other comments, or the comments that I can remember. Um, also, first, let me introduce the other organizer in case you haven't met him. He's a conspicuous guy in any crowd, so please bother him with questions whenever you can. And one other guy who directs the overall operations is Doug Omer, so uh, make sure that you know who he is. He'll generally have the most competent answers to any questions you have, so please sure, be sure to bother him. And you know, I'm just an absent-minded mathematician, so yeah, don't rely on me unless you're absolutely desperate. So. <laughs> right. Now, the main thing I wanted to comment on just now, as I said, we'll give you more information as the day progresses, but for the working groups, the people who are in the working groups, make sure you track down your advisors, the speakers you're attached to, as soon as possible if you haven't done so already. Yeah, for example, after the first lecture, try to track them down and introduce yourself and get a sense of what's going on. Um, we'll give you, uh, say more things about the working groups in the afternoon. Now. Um, the other thing was about the review sessions. You'll notice that there's a review session at the end of the day, besides the working groups in the afternoon, in the evening. Sorry, and uh, the general idea behind the review sessions um, is to make sure <coughs> that, um, that no graduate student is left behind. <laughs> and, uh, so. Um, there have been complaints in the past that sometimes people are entirely, get entirely lost, right? And the review sessions are intended to address that to some extent. But during that time, we want to make sure that people have at least the overall sense of what's going on and also have a chance to formulate, say, vague ideas that they have more sharply so that, for example, during the working session, you can ask the you can interact with the speakers more efficiently. So it's supposed to be sort of mediate between the lectures and the working sessions to some extent. But of course, you should come, uh, as I said, if you're totally lost, say, and would like some guidance, or, um, and especially even if you don't belong to the working sessions, you should definitely come to the review sessions as much as possible. There are also a few official TAs who will help you. Also, f first, during the review sessions, during the working sessions, and whenever they can, uh, if you track them down. Let me introduce to the people who volunteered. So, let's see, there's uh, Max Lieblich. Uh, Max? Yeah, so, he's over there. So, he agreed to help with Dick Haynes' um, working group. Um, Chris Rasmussen, uh, he'll help with Makoto Matsumoto's working group. Um, and Sinan Unver is over there. He'll help with Leila Schnapp's working group. And, let's see. Uh, who did we say about? Glory? Oh, yeah, Romiar. Yeah, where's, where's Romiar? Yeah, there's Romiar Sharifi. He'll help with the people who are working with Florian Pop. Okay, so it's, the, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Um, so he is, of course, one of the originators of the theory of Hodge structures on fundamental groups. He really precipitated many of the exciting arithmetical developments uh, that have arisen in the past decade or two. And, um, so it's, uh, a great pleasure to have him here, and I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from his lectures. Uh, Dick Kane from Duke is going to talk about geometry of the mixed Hodge structure and the fundamental group. Was that the right title? Approximately. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be the token topologist among all these algebraists. Um, so if you've looked at my notes, so the first three sections are in pretty good shape. The fourth still needs some work. The first and third sections are very long, and the second and fourth are short. So they won't correspond exactly to the lectures. So I'm going to try to do about two-thirds of the first section today. So <clears throat> so my job is to talk about the Durham theory of the fundamental group of the, fundam of the Riemann sphere minus three points, or of the projective line minus three points. And to do this, I have to start by discussing the Durham theory of the fundamental group. So today is just going to be topology. There won't be anything remotely related to arithmetic, well, evidently remotely related to arithmetic today. So let me just, again, because I think people here are more likely to be arithmetic, I'll just review Durham's theorem, the classical Durham theorem. So M, so t the topic today is the pi, Chen's pi one Durham theorem. Everything's named after Durand because he proved the prototypical theorem of this type that I'm about to explain. So M is a C infinity manifold. <clears throat> and if you like, you can just imagine the Riemann sphere minus three points. And uh, 
so what you what what one has here is the say the the standard singular homology of M. So this is defined to be the homology of some complex of chains. Uh, so maybe we'll call it HK of some complex of chains on M. And if we <clears throat> so these this is the free abelian group in degree, say, L, generated by maps of, so SL of M is going to be the free abelian group generated by maps of sigma L into M. Now, typically, one takes these to be continuous, but for smooth manifold, it's not hard to show that you can take these to be smooth. So this will be C infinity, and it's a standard boundary map, and you take the homology of this complex. And the standard construction is that the cohomology of M, say with coefficients in some ring R, is equal to the homology of the dual of this complex. But anyway, the point I want to make here is just simply that <coughs> you can compute singular homology using smooth chains rather than just continuous chains. And this is important because we want to be able to integrate. When you say smooth, do you mean piecewise or on some neighbor? Um, yeah, so the definition of a smooth map from a simplex into M means that, so you can put this in Euclidean space, say in, say, RL, so it'll be some, say, in degree two, it'll look, say, something like this. It, to say this, a map from here into M is smooth says there, is an open, there exists an open neighborhood of this in RL and a smooth map defined on that whose restriction to this is smooth. But it's actually smooth. <coughs> OK, so uh, one also has the complex of differential forms. And just for simplicity, I'll take differential forms always to be complex value, because that's what we'll be using. So EK of M is going to be equal to the smooth uh, C-valued uh, K forms on M. You can take them to be real valued, but for simplicity, let's just do this because eventually we'll be looking at Riemann surfaces where it's natural to take complex valued forms. And these form a complex, so you've got EK maps into EK plus one and so on. And there's something that connects them called the exterior derivative. So a differential form is taken to its exterior derivative. This forms a complex. And so the cohomology of this, co so this is known as the Durham complex. And you can take its cohomology, so you can take the homology of this complex, and this leads to, you to the Durham cohomology of M. It's just simply, say with complex coefficients, it's just simply equal to the homology of this complex. <clears throat> so this is a perfectly natural thing to do if you have a smooth manifold. And then Durham's theorem relates the two. So if you have the, uh, maybe the simplest way to say it is this. Uh, you can look at the Durham cohomology, say HK Durham of M. You can map this into uh, HK maps of HKM into C, which is also by the universal coefficient theorem, HK of M with complex coefficients. And you simply take the class of a, a closed form omega, so forms are called closed if they're in the kernel of D, and they're called exact if they're in the image of D. So you take the class of a closed form, you take it to the function here, which takes the homology class of Z, it takes it to the integral over omega of Z. And this is well defined by Stokes' theorem. Alternatively, you can just map this complex into this complex here via integration. But the point is that integration gives you an isomorphism between the Durham cohomology and the singular cohomology. <coughs> and in fact, this is a ring, 
the product is given by cut product, and this is a ring. The product here is given by standard formula, say the Alexander Whitney formula, uh, and this is a ring homomorphism, a ring isomorphism. Okay, so we want to generalize this to homotopy. So we're going to concentrate on the fundamental group. And when one tries to do this, one immediately runs into a problem. So I want to adjust. To, to the fundamental group. So it's useful at this stage to talk about path spaces. So in some sense, this Durham theorem for the fundamental group is going to be a Durham theorem for a loop space. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. But P of M, we're going to let this be equal to the set of gamma takes, say, 0, 1 into M, such that gamma is piecewise smooth. You might think it's easiest to deal with smooth things, but, uh, well, first of all, what's piecewise smooth? It will start out, it'll be smooth, and then it'll be a continuous map, which is uh, smooth on a finite set intervals in a finite partition of the unit interval. So this, this may be our gamma. <clears throat> and why do we take piecewise smooth paths? Because even if you have two smooth paths like this, when you compose them, you get a piecewise smooth path. Right? So it's a good, technically, this is the easiest thing to deal with. And now you can give this the compact open topology. You don't really have to understand this. The point is that paths in P of M are just going to correspond to homotopies of these paths. Right? So a path of paths is just a homotopy between them. <clears throat> and uh, so I'll let the, well, there's two things. We have, we can think of this as a, it's really a vibration over the product of the manifold with itself, you just take gamma down to its initial point and its terminal point. And the fiber over, say, AB, if you take AB in here, the fiber over it I'll call PAB of M. So it's just the paths that start at A, the piecewise smooth paths that begin at A and end at B. And now if you take the set of path components of this, uh, you can look at, I'll just think path components I'll denote by pi zero, pi zero of PABM, that's going to be, this is homotopy classes of paths. <clears throat> and so this will just be denoted by pi M colon AB. So. <clears throat> and so in particular one has that uh, you have a multiplication map pi M AB cross pi M BC. You get a multiplication map into pi M AC. Now, note that I'm a topologist and most topologists multiply paths in the following order. If you have a path from A to B and a path from B to C and this is alpha and that's beta, I call this alpha beta. A lot of people including Deline, and I can't remember what Goncharov does, would call this beta alpha. So I call this the sort of natural order of composing paths and the other order the functional order. And when you read the literature here, you've got to be careful. It's a, you can always switch, but you have to uh, make sure that when you're reading two different papers at the same time, they're using the same convention. But I prefer this because certain formulas look a lot more natural for the composing paths in the topologist's order. Okay, so the set of all of these guys is really, you can think of, uh, 
M is a, that, that there's a category whose objects are the points of M and where the morphisms from A to B are exactly these guys. And that's called the fundamental groupoid. So the fundamental groupoid So it's a category, the objects are points in M and the morphisms are simply the pi M A B. <clears throat> it's a groupoid because every morphism is an isomorphism. So it's just fancy language, but this fundamental groupoid of say certain spaces like P1 minus 0, 1 and infinity is an important arithmetic object. It'll be a motivic object. All right, so what we want to do is uh, I want to introduce the notion of what I call a homotopy functional. Ah, I should say one thing, of course. Pi 1 of m a is, of course, <laughs> equal to pi m a a, right? So the fundamental group is simply just the set of homotopy classes of paths from A to A. So you'll have to excuse a little bit of language here. Uh, homotopy functionals. So what we're really interested in doing, if we're trying, going to prove a Durham theorem for the fundamental group, is to look at functions from the path space, say into something, maybe I'll just say in the notes I've been more general, but let me just say C, or I could put any say C algebra here, say a set of matrices for example. Suppose I have a function. What do I call it? <clears throat> yeah. So I would like this function to depend only on the homotopy class of paths. So I'm going to say that F is a homotopy functional. If uh, F of gamma depends only on the homotopy class of gamma, on uh, sort of basically gamma in pi m a b. So if gamma is a path from a to b, you want it f to take the same value on it as it does from any other path you would obtain by deforming the original path, but leaving the endpoints fixed. And what we're interested in doing is using differential forms to construct such functions, right? Because then we'll construct, uh, because the path components of, say, uh, P sub A, B, M, or P, A, A, M, are just functions on the fundamental group. So we want to construct <clears throat> so if you've got so if we look at it like this, here's P, A, B, M. You map it, say, into C by F. It's a map here to pi M, A, B. And you basically, if this is a homotopy functional, it factors through this quotient map here. Like I say, our goal is to construct homotopy functionals using differential forms. Interesting. From the Durham complex of M. <clears throat> so there's a few really elementary and stupid observations I want to make. So what does interesting mean? Well, You've always got a, the, the Horavitz homomorphism from pi 1 m a into h 1 m. And you can always use closed forms to map the, you, yourself into here. You can, if, if d omega is equal to 0, the Durham theorem says you can, well, the Durham theorem says you can always find a closed one form to represent any linear functional from h 1 of m into here. So I consider these not so interesting. So what's more interesting is that you can write down a homotopy functional using differential forms that detects elements of the kernel of this mapping. And what are things in the kernel? They're commutators. 
So the kernel of the Horavitz homomorphism is the commutator subgroup. So the first problem here is that so, so remarks the first one is that standard line integrals are intrinsically abelian. And what do I mean by this? Well, if you take, um, say, two loops here, an alpha and a beta, and you take any one form, it doesn't matter whether it's closed or not. You may think you can be clever and use non-closed forms and do something. And if, but if you take omega and evaluate it on AB, that's the integral, and that's the integral beta, whoops. So ordinary line integrals can't detect the order in which you compose these paths. So they can't detect anything in the kernel here, even if omega is not closed. <clears throat> I should also point out over here that if you take any one form here, integral omega, so if you take a path gamma to integral gamma over omega, this is a homotopy functional precisely when omega is closed. It's one of the exercises in the notes. It's easily proved using Stokes theorem. So, <clears throat> so we have to do something more interesting and uh, Chen made such a definition. So, so this was made by Chen uh, probably in the early 60s and it's the following. So we're going to suppose that we've got smooth one forms and you can make them take values in an associative algebra, say for example in matrices. Um, and suppose that we have some gamma in, say, P of M, and we want to define the integral of gamma over omega 1, omega R. So this is just some formal expression of one forms. It's not their product. And this is, by definition, the integral over the time-ordered simplex. where when you pull back um, where gamma star of omega j is going to be equal to f j t d t. So when you basically restrict the one form to the path, you can write it as a function times dt. And then you integrate these, but you put separate variables in all the f's and you integrate over the time-ordered simplex. Ah. <laughs> <coughs> And when you first see this, you say, well, it looks a little bit, it doesn't look so nice. And there are fancy ways to write this down to make it look a lot nicer, but this is the most elementary way to look at this. And in the next lecture, I'll explain that, for example, polylogarithms and multiple zeta values and all this can be expressed as iterated integrals. So all sorts of interesting quantities occur as these kind of integrals. And you should view it as a a function from P of M into C. So in other words, two of these are equal if they give you the same function, not if. So there can be iterated integrals that look formally different that are in fact the same as functions. And in fact, Chen calculated the exact relations that you get. They won't really concern us here. <coughs> In the case we're interested in, two iterated integrals will be the same if and only if they're formally the same. Right. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so the first remark, in fact, I got a little out of order here. Anyway, the first remark is that, that one is that integral omega is the standard line integral.
So, and our goal is going to be to, ah, and a general iterated integral will be a linear combination of these. So our goal is to find linear combinations of these that are in fact homotopy functionals. So a general iterated integral is a linear combination of these basic ones of the basic <laughs> of various lengths. <clears throat> so I'll consider the length to be r, but the length's not well defined. You can sometimes write a longer iter iterated integral as a linear combination of, of shorter ones, in which case we'd view this as being the minimal length you can make the iterated integral. All right, so the, the next thing is uh, that integral omega is a homotopy functional in other words, gives you a function, say, on the fundamental group, is equivalent, as I said before, that to, d, to omega being closed. So omega here is a one form. But now, if you take, there, it's easy to see that uh, if you take things like uh, on the torus, say, dx dy is not a homotopy functional. Even though these are both, so if it, m is going to be equal to r2, say, mod z2, the torus, and x and y are the coordinates. And if you look at, uh, it's easy to check that this is not a homotopy functional. So if you go here, you take this path and this one, say alpha beta, oops, yeah. <clears throat> if you take alpha beta here and you also take uh, beta alpha, these paths are both homotopic to the diagonal. This iterated integral will take different values, even though it's an iterated integral of closed forms. But again, a lot of these things I'm stating here are exercises, easy exercises in the notes. But if M is a Riemann surface, and suppose that omega 1 up to, say, omega R are holomorphic, This implies that integral omega 1, omega r is a homotopy functional. So if you're on a Riemann surface, which we will be, and if all the forms are using a holomorphic, then in fact every iterated integral that you write down of these holomorphic forms will in fact be a homotopy functional and will give you a function on the fundamental group. In fact, this is Later on, we'll be taking all of these guys to be algebraic one form. So in particular, they'll be holomorphic. <clears throat> so all right, so. Iterated integrals have lots of uh, nice properties. And many of these properties just reflect the combinatorics of simplices. So let's, let me start out with the dumbest one, first of all, naturality. So if you've got, uh, so this is, this is just completely stupid, but I'll write it down just so we have it. Suppose M and N are smooth manifolds, and we have a smooth function between them, and we have a path uh, gamma here, so we have the composite path here, f circle alpha, f circle gamma, and suppose we have one forms here. So we have one forms on n, so we'll have their pullbacks here. So it's natural to relate the iterated integral of these guys on M over gamma to the iterated integral of these guys over this path, and it's completely trivial to prove that the integral of F circle gamma of W1 WR is simply equal to the integral of F star W1 over gamma. <clears throat> So this, this I'll call naturality. OK, the other properties are more interesting.
And the first is, well, um, I'll call this the co-product. So <coughs> the question is, how should we, how can we evaluate, or how do iterated integrals evaluate on the product of two paths? So we have two paths that are composable, alpha followed by beta, and we want to evaluate this iterated integral. Well, let's look at a very stupid example first. Let's just look at, well, we know how to do this when r is equal to 1. It's just the standard line integral. So let's do the next simplest case. In this case, uh, we're integrating over this. <coughs> we're integrating over this, this time-ordered simplex here. <coughs> so this is 1. This is 1. And now, and we're integrating. <coughs> so we should divide, we should actually divide this region up at 1 half because for the first half of the time, we'll be traversing alpha. And the second half, we'll be traversing beta. So here's one half here. And if you look at it, so we'll think of alpha here and beta here, alpha here and beta here. So if you look at the integral over this portion here, you'll see it's actually the integral, the definition of the iterated integral. So in this case, you're going to get integral w1, w2 over alpha beta. It's going to have three terms corresponding to each of these three pieces. The first is the integral w1, w2. You just, you write down the formula and you see that that's exactly what you get here. And if you integrate over this piece here, you'll see that you're integrating, you're using the definition with just the path beta, but everything shrunk down by a factor of two, but that doesn't matter. And then on this part here, this is just a product of two unit intervals, and you see that you've got an alpha, you're integrating alpha here and beta here, but it's a product, and Fabini's theorem just simply says that this is the product alpha beta, right? <clears throat> and so, uh, in general, what you do is you take the time-ordered simplex and you chop it up by all the planes. So what did we do here? We chopped it up with the, the lines t2 equals a half and t1 equals a half, and we examine the integral separately out over all the pieces. If you do this in general, in general, and again, this is a, the approach for doing this is described in the notes. In general, uh, what you do is you take the time-ordered simplex delta r, which I'll always think of as being 0 equal to less than t1, and cut it by, by the hyperplanes uh, tj equals one half, basically. So you just slice it up like we did here, and you look at all the integrals, and if you just write everything down carefully, you will see that this is equal to the integral alpha w1 wr plus the integral alpha w1 wr minus 1 integral beta wr plus integral, well, you keep just peeling one thing off, until you get to integral w1 alpha, integral w1, I guess I'm going to have to use bad blackboard technique, w, sorry, w2 wr beta plus integral. So there's this nice formula for how you evaluate an iterated integral on the product of two paths. Nice and combinatorial, and it just reflects this combinatorics of a, what happens when you divide a simplex up by slicing it with all these hyperplanes. So the second is the product. So the product is how do you pointwise multiply two iterated integrals? So it's the same. This guy here is a function on the path space. This is a function on the path space. How do we take the pointwise product of those two functions? And 
Again, there's a basic geometric fact about simplices here. Let me leave enough space. But here we're integrating over, we're really integrating over 0 equal less, less than t1 equal to a less than tr equal to a less than 1 times 0 equal to a less than tr plus 1 equal to a less than tr plus s equal to a less than 1. We've taken the product of an r simplex and an S simplex, and the question is, how do we decompose the product into simplices? There are standard formulas, but if we think about it, suppose I have, what we'd like to do is relate it to time-ordered simplices. Now, you've got R numbers in order, and you've got a further S in order. But if I, if I write down all those numbers, they may not be in order, right? But so think we're close to Las Vegas, or close, well, anyway, close to a casino, right? So what do people do in casinos? They shuffle cards, right? So here's the numbers T1 up to TR in order. Here are the ones T1 up to TS in order. And then you slot them in so they're in order, right? And up to a set of measure zero, there's a unique way to do that. I mean, if some of these Ts coincide with these, they're, they're sort of more than one way to do it. But that'll be a set of measure zero in the integrand. So the, the ways of putting a list of R things in order with a set of S things in order is called, they're called shuffles, right? So, and I'll write down the definition. So definition is that a permutation of the numbers one up to R plus S is a shuffle of type RS if, um, <clears throat> well, I'll write down the definition that you won't like. It always, it's always confusing when you first see it, and sigma inverse of r plus 1 is less than, is less than sigma inverse of r plus s. But what's the point here? When you write down, maybe I'll write down an example before I explain it. So what, what's a shuffle? Let's look at shuffles of type 2, 2. So you have the numbers 1 and 2, and the numbers 3 and 4. And what are all the possible shuffles? You can write them down in order. You can write down something like 1, 3, 2, 4. 1 and, three, 1 and 2 have always got to occur in order, and 3 and 4 have always got to occur in order, and so on. But so if, if this is our sigma, what's sigma inverse of 2? Sigma inverse of 2 is the position of 2, right? So this definition says that sigma inverse of 1, which is the position of 1, occurs before sig 2. The position of 2 occurs before the position of r, and so on. So that's what, a <clears throat> that's what a shuffle is. And if you look at the product of these two simplices, you can decompose it into a whole bunch of uh, time-ordered simplices of size r plus s, after you shuffle the coordinates by, or permute the coordinates by a shuffle of type RS. And I wrote down the formula, and when I try to do it off my head, I always get it backwards, so I'm not going to write it down. But it's explicitly in the notes. But what you find here is that this is equal to the integral. So S, this symbol here denotes the shuffles of type RS. So that's the so-called shuffle product formula. And let me give you a very simple example. Let's multiply the integral over alpha w1 by the, in let's pointwise multiply these two guys here. So we have to shuffle this list 2 and 3 together with this list 1 in all possible ways. So you'll just get integral alpha w1, w2, w3, plus integral w2, w1, w3 plus integral alpha w1, w, whoops, w2, w3, w1, right? So they just all occur in order. Two and three are always in order. <clears throat> so the next property is the antipode. So I'm writing these down so that these things look like a Hopf algebra. And in fact, they are. So it's the antipode. 
This, set, this tells us what happens when we evaluate an iterated integral on the inverse of a path. And again, this one's very easily verified. It's just minus 1 to the length times the integral wr w1 over gamma. So you just reverse the order of the one forms. And so the next and the, the next important property is nilpotence. Or you may want to call it unipotence. <coughs> Actually, before I mention this, I want to give a uh, another property which I'll just write down. It's easily verified. It says that suppose you have two paths. I have suppose I have a path here from A to B. I have gamma, and I have a different path where I go along and I parameterize the same path differently. So I go along and I go forward and back and here and speed up and slow down and so on. But basically the geometric path is the same. So there'll be gamma and I could also look at gamma circle say phi where if you want to be fancy phi is an element of uh, P01 of the unit interval. So it's just a path from 0 to 1 in the unit interval. And you think of that as a reparameterization. So this is a reparameterization of gamma. Okay. So the basic fact here is that if you take two, and so you can generate an equivalence relation on paths by saying that gamma is equivalent to this guy, and you generate, and that generates an equivalence relation. And if two paths are equivalent in this equivalence. Well, may, I'll write it down in the simplest possible way. Iterated integrals do not see differences in parameterization. And so when I write down this property here, <coughs> um, I'm going to need this fact. I mean, it's also relevant when you, for things like associative laws, because path multiplication is not associative, but it's associative up to reparameterization. <clears throat> All right, so, so this property says we're going to suppose, uh, well, we're going to take omega 1 up to omega r in E1 of m. Yeah, sorry, let me just do a little bit more footwork here before I start on this. <clears throat> So let's look at uh, the paths on M, but we can mod out by this equivalence relation of parameter. So this is the equivalence relation where gamma will be equivalent to a reparameterized version of gamma. And I'm going to set uh, PMX be, to be equal to the free abelian group generated by the paths from x to x on M modulo reparameterization. So it's just the free abelian group on parameterized cl parameterization classes of paths. And so this has a multiplication, and so on has an, an associative multiplication. So elements of this will be things like C equals sum, say, n gamma gamma, where gamma is a parameterization class of paths. And it's clear that iterated integrals can be evaluated on these. You can define the iterated integral of w1, wr over c simply by linearity. <clears throat> so iterated integrals are defined on this guy here. And so the nilpotence property is that suppose we have And now I'm going to look at the iterated integral omega 1, omega r, and I'm going to evaluate it. So I want, 
when, when the expression is complicated, I'll use diamond brackets for evaluation. Say alpha 1 minus what I'll call 1x, alpha 2 minus 1x, alpha s minus 1x. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to take a... Pr so 1x stands for the class of the constant loop at x in here. So this will essentially have a 1. So 1x is an element of here. And it's the class of the constant loop at x, the class that doesn't move. And so this is an expression in this algebra here, PMX. And the statement is that this is equal to 0 if s is bigger than r. It's the product of the integral wj over alpha j, j equals 1 to r, if r is equal to s and, it, and it's equal to question mark. It's just, there's nothing sensible you can say when s is less than r. <clears throat> okay, so this is an important property because it's telling you, well, In the notes, I explain why if you apply this with r equal to 1 and s equal to 2, it's just simply the property um, Okay. So the fact that iterated integrals of length 1 or standard line integrals are somehow abelian this, this genera generalizes this fact. And it's going to tell you that, uh, I mean, a fancy way to say this is it's telling you that iterated integrals occur as periods of matrix representation, of unipotent representations of pi 1 of m. I mean, I'm sort of jumping ahead there, but. <clears throat> All right, so let me. Um, A proof of this is written out in the notes. I won't do it because I'm try I want to try to get to the Durham theorem. And before I do that, I need to discuss the group algebra. Okay. So, and it's dual. Okay, so we need a Durham theorem, so somehow I, it looks like I might have constructed some interesting differential forms. But now I need to talk about, if you, well, if you're going to prove a Durham theorem, you typically, well, because differential forms or iterated integrals form a vector space, they, the set of iterated integrals that are homotopy functionals has to equal some other vector space. So if you're going to prove a Durham theorem for the fundamental group, you've got to turn it into a vector space, right? And so I'm about to turn the fundamental group into a vector space or a whole bunch of vector spaces. And there's various ways to do this, and I've picked the most direct and simple, but n not the most cosmic. But they're all equivalent. So anyway, so suppose that R is a ring and, you, and pi is a group. Think of a discrete group, so, such as the fundamental group of a manifold, and R pi is equal to the group algebra. So it's just the, the free R module generated by pi with the natural multiplication. So it's just equal to the direct sum over G in pi of R. <coughs> and it has, so its elements, a typical element would be some R G G where this is g is in pi, and this is a finite sum. And you just, these guys are in r, and these are just formal symbols. So there is an augmentation which takes r pi into r. It just takes the sum of r g g, and it just takes it to the sum of the coefficients r g. And you can think of this as, if you like, as the group ring of the trivial group. And this is just induced by the homomorphism from pi to the trivial group. And the kernel of epsilon is denoted by j, is called the augmentation ideal. So 
So when, when uh, R is a field like the complex numbers, this is a, a maximal ideal. And it's easy to show that J, whoops, it's standard algebra and easy to show that J is equal to the free R module generated by, by the set of G minus 1 such that G is in pi, G is not equal to the identity. <clears throat> and so we have a topology on the group algebra. So again, lots of people here, I assume, are number theorists. So number theorists like putting strange topologies on things. So we've got the j adic topology. On our pi. So it's just given by j to the 0 for me just means all of r pi, and this will contain j, will contain j squared, contains, and so on. So you've got this filtration. And so the rth power of j is generated by things that look like this, right, if, if pi is the fundamental group. <clears throat> so that's why somehow this augmentation ideal is fitting in naturally with this nil potence property of iterated integrals. And now I'm going to let r pi hat be equal to the j adic completion. So it's the inverse image of r pi mod j to the m plus 1. Okay. <clears throat> so, and this is a nice thing. And to give you some idea of what it's like, it's an easy exercise, it's in the notes, is to show that well, we always learn that pi 1 abelianized is h1. But there's a group ring version of that. It just says that maybe I'll put a j sub r on this to tell you it's the augmentation ideal of the group algebra, group algebra with coefficients in r. But if you take j r mod j r squared, this is isomorphic naturally to h1 of pi r. So that just, this just by definition is pi abelianized tensored with R. And the isomorphism just takes the coset of G minus 1. This just corresponds to the class of G. So, <clears throat> so this tells us that actually... Uh, So this tell so if you look at um, if you look at say so r pi hat contains the closure of j right so the I'll just write the completion of j and this maps onto j mod j squared and you can take a section so take a section back in here a section and this will induce a map from the tensor algebra so this is equal to h1 of pi r. So the tensor algebra on h1 of pi r maps to r pi hat. And now you can complete this guy. So this is, so this is the tensor algebra. So this is the direct sum m greater than or equal to 0 of h1 tensor m. Right, just this tensor algebra. You can complete it, which makes it into a free, basically a power series algebra of non-commuting variables. And this is subjective because <clears throat> just by the nature of how we completed, we completed using the, the powers of an ideal. So you should think of the completed group algebra as being some sort of uh, non-commutative power series algebra with some relations in it. In fact, that's a completely accurate way to think of it. And the variables that, or the indeterminants, correspond to a basis of the first homology. <clears throat> so, got just a few minutes uh, here. Again, I explain this in more detail in the notes. Um, so let me look at the continuous dual.
Sorry? But I thought I started late, right? L let me let me at least let me just say this, and I'll state the Durham theorem. I'll I'll finish by ten o one. All right. <laughs> the continuous dual is harm. Say I'll just state like this: harm continuous of say r pi or r pi hat. It doesn't matter into r just for simplicity. This is just going to be the direct limit of the harm. Uh, so I'm going to view this as a discrete module. It's just r pi modulo j to the m into r, right? So that's, and I claim that this guy here is a, I always get mixed up in terminology, a Hopf algebra or a bi-algebra. It has a product, it has a coproduct, and it has an antipode. So this has an antipode so in, induced by elements of the group going to their inverse. It's got a product because these are functions on, they're sort of continuous functions on here, and you can pointwise multiply them, so it's got a product. And it's got a coproduct, which is dual to multiplication of paths or multiplication of group elements. So, <clears throat> and it's also got an augmentation. You can evaluate at the identity. It's got an augmentation at the identity in, in pi. <clears throat> right. So this is a nice object. And so that I finish, maybe even by 10, I will just state the Durham theorem. And I will spend, I, I will explain it in more detail in the next lecture and prove it in a very special case, namely that of a Zariski open subset of the Riemann sphere. Uh, as well, because it's important, it's key in what we do. So what does Chen's Durham theorem say? It says, if you look at, I'm going to call CHPXXM, this is going to be equal to the iterated integrals Uh, restricted to to p x x m <clears throat> restricted to the loop space h zero of this is going to be those that are homotopy functionals in other words whose Value on a path depend on a loop at x depends only on its homotopy class, and then the <clears throat> so this is a Hopf this is a commutative Hopf algebra. So it's got an or and it's augmented. So it's got an augmentation, an antipode, a product, and a coproduct. I wrote them down before. So products, the shuffle product, the co-products, this very sort of night, it's sort of the free co-product. And so the theorem is that you've got integration. Ah, <clears throat> well, first of all, I make an observation. If I take H0 of Chen PXXM, it maps into HOM, say, z pi 1 of m x. It maps these into c, because I'm looking at complex value iterated integrals. The nil potence property tells me that it's actually, um, that they're all continuous homomorphisms. That's the, that's the whole point of the nil potence property, and it's important. <clears throat> and the theorem is, this is an isomorphism of, and there's another word that I'll explain, half algebras. Right? So, <clears throat> sorry? Maybe we should stop now. I am, I'm stopping. <laughs> oh, it's 10.02. But I wanted to state the theorem. Thank you.
Buenos